Atheist Nomads, episode 143, Satanic Temple of Seattle with Lilla Starr. The podcast you're about to listen to includes cursing and talking about hoo-hahs. Please be advised. We are the Atheist Nomads, bringing you history, science, politics, religion, and interviews with leaders in the atheist community. Not all those who wander are lost. Welcome to another episode of Atheist Nomads. I am Dustin. Joining me as always is Wesley. Hello, everybody. And joining us today is Lilith Starr from the Satanic Temple of Seattle. Hello. Uh, We've Hello. already talked to uh, Lucian Greaves from the National uh, Organization. And uh, one of your, uh, your members, uh, you are the... Uh, Seattle chapter um, leader, correct? Chapter head, yes. Chapter head, head. Ah, I, I was going to say head. It was like, I head sounds right, but no, oh, yeah, head, head. And I, I asked this before we started recording, so I should have remembered. Yeah. yeah, we also talked to an old friend of mine who I've known for years, uh, Case. He was an amazing yes. guy. Yes, he was. He basically ran the whole Bremerton event that we did. It was really awesome. So, yeah. I'm glad you got to be on your show. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, Lilith, why uh, why are you a Satanist? I'm a Satanist because I read the Satanic Bible um, in 2011. And what I found in it, I really needed at that time. And then later, when I finally got off, um, I was a drug addict for 17 years. I finally got off it mm-hmm. um, after nine years in NA. By using the philosophy I, I found in the Satanic Bible, um, which is basically Whoa. is, yeah. <laughs> That's so, my story in a nutshell. Sorry. <laughs> so instead of of the the uh, the the druggie comes to Jesus story, it's the druggie came to Satan story. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Oh, that is. <laughs> if I had a nickel perfect. for every time. <laughs> oh man. You know, it's not it's not the normal path, but I've really never taken the normal path, so. It's so much better than the normal path. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> normal yeah. path is boring and it leads to uh, being in, in shackles. So, yeah. And, and not consensual. Well, it messes probably consensually, consensual. but not in the fun way. Yeah. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's how I started with Satanism. Um, you know, I liked what I found in the Satanic Bible about you being your own highest power, you know, and I took from that. You know, that you deserve self-compassion instead of self-hate, the religion kind of voice on you. And also that you have within you all the power you need to do whatever, like quit your addiction. Um, and, and it really struck me as a big contrast to the 12-step program. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if you guys are, you probably are familiar with how religious that program is. Yes. yes. Um, and I tried the last nine years of that addiction, I was trying in Narcotics Anonymous, I was going to weekly meetings, trying to work the steps, um, you know, but everything was about, well, you are powerless. You have to admit you're powerless and ask God to reach in and basically take away your defects. Um, and that was a really hard model for me, you know, because I don't believe in a higher power. Um, you know, I'm a strict atheist. Um, you know, if I have spirituality, it's it's you know, it doesn't involve any kind of a higher power. And I asked them, okay, well, can your higher power be yourself? And they said, no, that's the one thing it can't be. It can oh. be a doorknob. It can be the group. It can be your, you know, or even a doorknob. It just can't be yourself. Um, you know, and so I tried really hard to work that program, but it was just not helpful at all. Um, it, it just, you know, it made me feel powerless because I don't have a higher uh-huh. power depend on um and so i'd feel powerless and say well i'm powerless to resist i'm going to go buy the nitrous oxide which was my drug at the time um so it it just didn't work for me uh but then when i met my husband um he was a satanist and that was his satanic bible that i read um you know that was finally the philosophy that allowed me to just say yeah there's nothing outside me that's going to fix it if anyone's going to fix it it's it's got to be me yeah i I have zero choice yeah the power to do so. I, I took a lot of uh, psychology classes in college, and I was I was studying to be a minister, so I also took all the theology classes, oh. where they try to tell you that Jesus is the solution to all the problems. One of the things I was finding in all of my other classes was, no, no, 
you are it's it's you if you want to solve things you have to take steps to do it even if praying is how you work that out in your mind you still have to take those steps right right there's no invisible hand that's going to come fix you mm -hmm. you know and there is they say it's a spiritual not religious program but you know in our in alcoholics anonymous we said the lord's prayer after meetings you know i didn't want to stand there and say the lord's prayer <laughs> You know, just to go mm -hmm. to supposedly therapy that was going to fix me. Um, so I struggled with it, and and it was finally Satanism that you know kind of empowered me to finally get off. Um, so I started with nitrous oxide, but I ended with heroin. Oh, uh, the five month heroin addiction, and it wow. was it was finally that philosophy that you know I was able to get off, and then I was able to stay off because I knew I had to take steps to build a life where there was no mm -hmm. room. And I was the only one that could do that. So. Uh, congratulations for surviving. Well, thank you. It was, a, it was an interesting journey, one I wouldn't really recommend, but it taught me a lot. Uh, I, I lost a nephew to heroin, so. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Oh, congratulations so on surviving, for sure. Well, thank you. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Wow. So, all right. So, so you, you Satanism got you out of out of all of, uh, of this. Yes. And... So how did you go from, okay, Satanism has got me out of all of this to becoming the head of a chapter? Um, so uh, once I had kind of gotten myself out of, out of the sticky situation, I realized that I had to make um, social connection. And um, I found that Satanists online, there was just so much knowledge and, and, you know, a lot of compassion and people who actually knew what the world was about. I started, um, I started being the head editor for the Satanism Facebook page, which doesn't sound like much. And it certainly is not much now with the way pages are on Facebook, but at the time it was reaching a whole lot of Satanists all over the world. Um, and we were, uh, you know, writing, articles just like it was a magazine and I was the lead editor for that for a while um, and I really enjoyed that but you know that's online that's not mm -hmm. people um, in the meantime my husband and I were extremely isolated um, I have chronic pain and I can't you know I don't have a car I'm disabled so we don't go anywhere we don't really see any people um, except now the chapter um, so was the the pain a factor in you getting into drug abuse um, not the physical pain, but I have okay. severe depression. I, I also have disabling depression and, you know, the depression fed the addiction. I'd go out and have a binge and then just feel awful about myself, you know, and then sink back down into the depression and it was a cycle. Um, so it certainly wasn't the physical pain to get me started, but boy, by the end, um, I just have a really wrecked back and knees and that heroin was taking care of it at first mm -hmm. you know, it was definitely a factor well it, it's an opiate and opiates are the best painkillers absolutely for a while <laughs> you know? and then suddenly they're not and if you don't have them it's worse than death you know at least for heroin so yeah the pain was a factor um luckily it hasn't really ever driven me back to the opiates just because i know they're so they're so bad like after a couple months i was feeling all the pain, but I was doing a hundred bucks worth of heroin a day. Um, oh, wow. You know, so I don't really have any desire to go back to that. Thank goodness. Um, and I use a lot of cannabis. Um, I usually ingest it for my pain. I have a tincture that's high CBD for my pain and it's, nice. it's certainly no heroin, but you know, it, it really does help give some pain relief. Okay. Yeah. Do you usually use like a, uh, a butter or an alcohol base? Um, I make my own alcohol-based tincture uh, for nice. for the CBD bed, and and then um, I do eat Rick Simpson oil on occasion. Um, it, it's the best way to get a concentrated, you know, amount that you can ingest without having to have a brownie um, or a cookie or anything. Um, it's basically like eating a brownie. Um, I had some before the show. <laughs> okay, <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> Yay, Washington State. <laughs> so, um, so, so I got uh, I, I got out of the heroin, out of the addiction. Finally, that was in um, oh, let's see, 2013, October 2013. Um, 
And then out of the gate, you know, I was looking for community. I wanted to connect with people. Um, I started seeing uh, the Satanic Temple in the news for mm -hmm. the really great stunts they were pulling. Um, I'm pretty sure I first heard of them um, doing doing the Baphomet, the giant eight foot mm -hmm. you know, Hans Baphomet statue that they were going to put on the Oklahoma Capitol lawn. Um, and, you know, when I saw them come on the scene, I was like, wow, these guys are really doing some awesome things. And I went to their website and I looked at their tenets. I thought, wow, this is like way better than the Levian type of Satanism. Like it's still, you know, talks about the power of the individual, but it also recognizes that we're a social species, you know, that compassion and empathy are needed for a society. Um, and I, I, I like their belief system a lot. Um, so, you know, obviously, since they were Satanists and I was a Satanist and they were in the news, I was super interested in everything they were doing. Um, and at the time, you know, I was kind of a little bit closed about being a Satanist. Like, I'd, I'd mm. kind of worry about if I was walking around, you know, my neighborhood, you know, oh, do I have my little Bahamut out? Um, you know, because a lot of people have a really negative reaction to Satanism. Mm -hmm. Um, sometimes it's even like a super gut reaction if you've been raised, uh, you know, in a fundamentalist household where it's just been drilled into you that Satan is out there and evil, you know. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you know, I, I was a little, I was a little closed about it. Um, and then they did the coloring books um, in oh, the yeah, down in Florida with the cutest little satanic kids activity book ever you know, with teaches tolerance and compassion and respect and, you know, kids can draw a little pentagram on it. <laughs> connect the dots. Yeah. Um, you know, I saw them just being brilliant at exposing the hypocrisy of the religious right. Like, oh, it's perfectly fine for you to foist your Bibles on students, but we can't have our really cute little activity book. So we'll sue. And so either you'll have to stop or, you know, hand ours out and yeah. it just seemed brilliant you know well and, uh, and coloring books are just so awesome anyway right and it was oh, actually yeah. activities instead of here go read this awful book with like murder and incest and mm -hmm. you know <laughs> well me and meredith are really big into like adult coloring her way more than me but it's so much fun did you do the activity book yet <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, a lot of my friends are into coloring. It's super neat to see all that art going through. My wife's actually finishing up uh, making a coloring book right now. Really? Really? What's yeah, thing? it's on uh, Idaho native plants and birds. Uh, she's uh, right now trying. It, this was just going to be started out as for fun, but then she got a grant um, through the uh, Idaho Native Plant Society to go to some uh, botany thing. It's a week long trip to. Uh, an island out in the middle of Lake Superior, right on the Canadian border, and she'll be doing plant identification there, getting a lot of training on how to identify plants. It's a thousand dollars. That trip's going to cost more than a thousand bucks. So yeah. she decided, okay, so rather than making a coloring book for fun, um, this is going to be a coloring book to raise money for this trip. Oh, that's awesome! Yeah, nice. Yeah, yeah. So she's volunteering at the Idaho Native uh, Plant Sale at the botanical garden this weekend and uh, she'll be selling those there and at the uh, local nature center as well oh neat and oh, the library's adult coloring night oh really that's yeah. awesome the boise public library has an adult coloring night that's kind of fucking cool thursday nights <laughs> it is really taken off here <laughs> <laughs> so um i guess let me get back to the story of how oh, yes, actually yes. i ended up here so <laughs> You know, I was watching TST, the Satanic Temple, in the news um, and really supporting what they what were doing, you know. And then um, the Hobby Lobby ruling came down that, you know, the Supreme Court decided that a corporation has the religious freedom, you know, to not pay for contraception for, you mm -hmm. know, to, to not fulfill that part of the insurance. And... The Satan, and, you know, it was a huge blow, you know, for for freedom, basically, especially for women's reproductive rights, obviously. And um, the Satanic Temple responded by using that same ruling to make a waiver that a woman could bring to, you know, the abortion clinic that basically says, um, you know, my religious belief includes 
this tenet of the satanic temple that one's body is inviolable. And, you know, if, if I submit to your waiting period and your inaccurate medical forms, you're violating that deeply held belief that I have. Um, and legally, you can't do this. And they use the Hobby Lobby ruling as the case example, like, you know, religious freedom legally has a lot of rights and we have those same rights. Um, and eventually that waiver was taken by one of the women in Missouri who was trying to get an abortion and resulted in a lawsuit that we're, we're still doing there to try mm. to, to try to get rid of some of those just terrible, you know, inaccurate medical info and waiting periods. And uh. um, so anyway, so I saw that happen in the news and that, that just kind of fired me up. I thought, wow, how do I get involved? How do I join this organization? Cause I really, really like what they're doing. Like, you know, the coloring books and the, and the statue are kind of in good fun and, and mm -hmm. certainly riled up people a lot. But here, here was something super important and serious that is just completely under fire in today's nation by those theocrats. Sure and, I, is. and I thought, wow, they have a super effective weapon to do that. And I want to get in on helping. Um, and so I looked on their site. I, I, you know, I thought, okay, well, is there a Seattle chapter? And the only chapter they had at the time was the Detroit chapter. Um, yep. So, but I happened to be looking at their website on the time that they had opened it up to new chapters. So I mm. wrote them and I said, you know, hey, I noticed there's not a Seattle chapter, but you can start a chapter. Has somebody already started one? And if not, you know, can I, can I apply to do that? And nobody else had. And so, um, you know, they sent me an application. Um, I had an interview. It was kind of like, you know, getting a job. Um, and, and they decided that um, I was fit to lead. So, oh, so they gave me the charter. <laughs> Thank you. And um, basically, you know, that was in December 2014. Um, that's when we had our first meeting. And so now we're up to, what are we at? April 2016. And we've been going, we've been growing like since the beginning. Um, and now we've got, I think, 65 registered members and um, about 20, between 15 and 20 usually show up to our meetings. Okay. Uh, so, and it totally fulfilled that need I had for community. Um, I'm sort of naturally a community builder. Like I want, I want a community and if it's not there, I will build it. And it, this really gave me the chance to do that in something that's super important to me. Like it's basically my core path, this philosophy. So it's it's been incredible an incredible journey. It really has. Hey, Wesley, have you made it out to one of their meetings yet? I've been to a few quite a few actually. Oh. Um I haven't been oh, yeah. recently. Sorry. It's kind of far. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm coming from Bremerton. MJ's coming from Tacoma. Yeah. It's yeah. It is a, a bit of a drive sometime. Further for her than you, but really? faster for her than you. <laughs> because if you just hop on the ferry and go over, that's that's not a oh. long distance. It just is slow. True. Well, I mean, we're not just going to the ye old curiosity shop downtown. <laughs> yeah, you got to make your way to True. Bell, So it's a whole Yeah, it, it's a little bit of a haul still. <laughs> <laughs> um, we definitely welcome the public to come to our public meetings. Uh, we have public informational meetings every two months at the Fremont Library uh, downstairs. Um, and I love how much, how, you know, the Fremont Library is always super nice to us and they give us big smiles when we come in. It's kind of neat. Well, it's, it's Fremont. It's, it's the weirdest exactly. part of Seattle. Exactly. They got yeah. the troll. <laughs> right? <laughs> We're so, like, in a way, our chapter is super lucky to be here. We have so much community support. Um, we went downtown a couple times and handed out our flyers well, next to Jehovah's Witnesses, and so many people took them. Let's get to that in more detail right after we take a break. Okay. Atheist Nomads is proudly brought to you by Archway Hosting. Check out their low price, full featured hosting solutions at archwayhosting.com. That's A R C H W A Y hosting.com. Hey, we're also brought to you by listeners just like you. Find out how you can become a patron at patreon.com forward slash atheist nomads. That's P A T R E O N.com forward slash atheist nomads. 
Okay, so what I was saying before the break, um, our chapter is really lucky to be in such a progressive city. I think we're probably the luckiest chapter. Um, people around Seattle really support us. Um, we've gone out and done public actions where we stand next to the Jehovah's Witnesses that are in front of the downtown bus tunnels and Nordstrom's. And we hand out our literature, our satanic literature, right next to them handing out theirs. Um, and we actually <laughs> started doing this because we had a couple requests from people in various downtown and Amazon buildings um, to come and do something about the Jehovah's Witnesses that were always there. And also Christian protesters would be like yelling at them as they went into their office. So we actually got a request to do that. And when we went down there and handed out the satanic literature, a lot of people took it and a lot of them supported <laughs> what they were doing. And some of them, you know, made the sign of the cross as they went by. It's still really nice to see Christians like turning their, their heads away from the Jehovah's Witnesses too, though. That you're actually getting support from and well, derision from both sides, really. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of the other chapters aren't so lucky. The, the people out in Texas, um, we have a new chapter in Utah, um, <laughs> one in Arizona. Those people really have their work cut out for them. It's so conservative there and superstitious. Like they were going to do an invocation at, in Phoenix, the mm -hmm. Arizona chapter, and people came to protest at the the council meeting and they were like, worried about the evil eye and cursing and you know super superstitious stuff still so <laughs> so okay yeah. last i heard on the phoenix one i don't know how closely you've been following it but last i saw they changed the policy to not allow invocations and then as soon as that date passed that the satanists were supposed to do there is like well actually yes we'll have invocations but only certain people can do it yes do you know where that that settled yeah. at this point so that's what happened. Um, now we're thinking about filing a suit because you can't you can't do something that will you know obviously exclude one group. Mm -hmm. That's that's the part that really you know makes it illegal. So that's we the have Greece ruling in a nutshell is you exactly. can have invocations in the name of Jesus as long as you also allow invocations in the name of everyone else. Right. And yeah. these people have, they just don't get it. You know, it's like a personal crusade for them. Like literally the, the Christians down there just can't even fathom that another religion could exist or, you know, be given the same rights as them and certainly not Satanists. But, <laughs> the, so, the last um, I, the last uh, I heard, uh, you know, yeah, this is just a, a total Greece V Galloway, just BS romp that they're yep. having. But yep. it's but they have it right now set so that uh, only uh, like actual oh what is the proper term chaplains Chaplain. chaplains from the fire yeah. department or the police department yeah mm -hmm. that's right right and and you know they've even said that they were doing this to exclude this uh, to exclude <laughs> us you know they've tweeted the council people have tweeted out oh well we're gonna stop the satanic temple by doing this mm -hmm. and. They're just shooting themselves in the foot legally, you know, so I've, that's kind of where that is. I've actually been kind of impressed with how Hindus <laughs> seem to kind of uh, be following along with the Satanists right now because Oklahoma City, they uh, at the Capitol building there, uh, right after the Satanists put in their application, Hindus put in an application for putting in a, a statue of one of their gods. Oh, yeah, I remember that. That uh, was yeah. cool, yeah. There was a Hindu from a Hindu organization in Nevada that came up to Boise last year to do an invocation at the Idaho State uh, Senate, I believe it was. And, yeah, yeah there at least one Hindu organization in the U.S. is right there with you guys, not necessarily in agreement, but... Right. Doing the same, thing. the same thing. That's great. You know, multiple attacks. Mm -hmm. And, you know, eventually they'll see, well, we want, we want religion in the government. Oh, whoops. But we don't want Satanism in the government. Oh, what do we do now? And, and those Hindus, they're, they're <laughs> yeah, polytheists. They're just as bad as those Satanists. Right. Yep. You know, when you're a Christian, everything is Satan. Basically. Yeah. Yeah. You, you quote unquote, worship one Satan. They worship millions. <laughs> Ooh. Right. Oh, and that's something I, I do want to tell the listeners. Uh, the Satanic Temple does not believe in 
um, any kind of supernatural being or force or anything. Um, we don't believe in a literal Satan. We don't believe in God. Um, we take our Satan, the symbol of Satan, from like Anatole France in the 1914 uh, version. Basically, the Satan of Paradise Lost who stands up to God um, and says, no, you know, you don't have any authority or reason to have your authority for me to submit to you. Um, and that was taken up, you know, as a cry for freedom against the monarchy um, and and the church, um, you know, in the 1800s. So that's where we take ours from. It's a literary Satan, but that's definitely the number mm-hmm. of misconception people have. They think we're, you know, worshiping Satan. Um, so, nope, we're not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Kind of uh, when, when it's an explicitly atheistic religion, it's kind of hard to believe in the adversary of God. Definitely. And and we call ourselves a non-theistic religion. Oh, okay. Just because generally atheists are, you know, you're you're sort of against religion in general. We because we are a religion, we can't really be an atheist religion necessarily. That, true, that doesn't true. necessarily make sense logically. So we call ourselves a non-theistic religion. Um much like Zen Buddhism, you know, there's no God okay. there. Yeah. And I have heard Zen Buddhism referred to as an atheistic religion, but yeah, non-theistic religion it does make a lot more sense. I think we're trying yeah. to get it, get that term used more. Right? That's my understanding. Okay. I, I like it. I like it. But yeah. So, and that, that's a whole nother can of worms. Like the great thing about, you know, the constitution is the government can't really decide what is a religion based on beliefs. Like they can't discriminate like that. Like, Oh, only if you believe in the Christian God, you know, can you be a religion with all the perks that that comes with? Um, So. Yeah, that would really fall apart. And even if you said you had to believe in a God, uh, there's a lot of Eastern, uh, Eastern East Asian religions that don't necessarily believe in a God. Yeah, absolutely. You can't exclude those or else you're a racist. Right? Yeah. So, you know, legally, um, you can't really require a belief in a, in a supernatural being. Um, what the temple would like to do is basically divorce the superstition from religion. Like, we believe religion can fill a need for people, like a need for community, um, meaning, um, you know, a set of values like our seven tenets. Um I think people are naturally looking for something like that, but it shouldn't have to come with some made up sky father, right? Like, you know, (laughs) we have everything we need to make that just here without those external beliefs. So we're sort of pushing that envelope. This is our religion. Mm -hmm. It's deeply held. I mean, you know, these beliefs help me totally beat addiction. I would call, you know, like you said, the Jesus saves the Satan saves story. Yeah. Um, well, and, and like you compare that to Unitarians who mm-hmm. are not necessarily theistic. Uh, I think uh, last numbers I heard was forty percent identify as atheists. Hmm. Uh, with their ministers, it's closer to sixty percent identify as atheists. That's interesting. And so, but they are open to superstition and spirituality and religious beliefs of all types. Uh, so that, that's, but that is definitely a step towards divorcing religion from superstition. And I see the, the Satanists with the way you're describing it as the next logical step. We think so. I don't know that Unitarians would necessarily (laughs) like hearing that the Satanists are the the natural next step, (laughs) but. (laughs) I don't know. You know, at our public meeting this last weekend, we had three kids come from a Unitarian youth group. Like they were on their youth group outing to see what (laughs) Satanists were all about. Oh, nice. Yeah. (laughs) Like, okay, cool. So maybe they are. (laughs) I remember a couple of months ago, there was a pastor there from another church. Was that the lady in purple? Yes. I think she was Unitarian, wasn't she? No, no. She um the deal with her was she wants you to believe she's a Unitarian, but she just has one of the Universal Life Church, you know, oh. five minutes online oh. thing. She's built this whole persona for herself. Huh. Um huh. she she decided that she wouldn't join because um 
I wouldn't tell her the legal names of the people of everyone that runs the organization. You know, a lot of us use pseudonyms to protect our families mm -hmm. and, our, and our jobs. Um, right. And she just demanded that, you know, we give up all those names. Wow. I right. I didn't hear it. that. So, yeah, so yeah, yeah. that's scandalous. That no. <laughs> wow. That's, that's nuts. <laughs> it was pretty nuts. She was pretty nuts. So yeah. Uh, Cause uh, you know, little star awesome name there's oh, yeah. no way you not your your mom gave you that though <laughs> no nope. she was a happy but even still nope <laughs> <laughs> nice nice yeah. but you did choose well for your pseudonym oh well, thank you thank you somebody else chose it and i liked it oh, okay <laughs> they chose it for me and i'm like yes that's the one <laughs> although i've been called the matriarch of darkness in the chapter that oh. i like that you know like the dead mother from hell. Uh -huh. There's a lot. Of, <laughs> there's a lot of really young people in the chapter. Um, so many that you know have been rejected and abused by their parents just horribly. Um, it's kind of a refuge for them. You know, they, it's a community, and everyone is very, very different from each other. But you know, we're all united in a pretty simple common goal to take on the religious right, and our. Mm -hmm. Tenants are, are, you know, very clear and short and concise. So we get a lot of very different people, um, but a lot of them say, wow, this is the first time I've ever felt comfortable with a group because basically all of us have been excluded from groups and from society our whole life, um, often starting with our parents. Oh, wow. So, oh, yeah. so it's a really interesting dynamic. Yeah. Um, all right. Let's, yeah, let's talk more about th that dynamic uh, after uh, our second break. We love hearing from our listeners. You can email us at contact at atheistnomads.com, tweet us at atheistnomads, send us a message on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash atheistnomads, or better yet, call us and leave us a message at 541-203-0666. We might even play it on the show. You can also help us out by leaving us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcast directory of choice. And yes, we're an atheist podcast, but I, I love the number 666. I was raised Adventist, so uh, the mark of the beast. Yes, I, I, I accept that uh, wholeheartedly. <laughs> um, so, so how does that, uh, the, the, the whole community angle, because typically with a, like a, a religious community, you have you know, people start coming, and then before long, that is their social group. Um, and p those are the people they're meeting with outside of, of the meetings as well. Uh, is that happening in your group as well? Oh, absolutely. Um, I encourage it a lot um, because with my disability, I can't do social things. Um, but for almost everyone, this is their very first chance to kind of have friends that get them, you know, and have a group of people that are like minded and that can hang out and have fun together. Um, so it's just it's beautiful to watch that, to, to see people who have never had that you know, start to go out to movies together, a beer, do D and D games. It's really neat. So uh, yeah, you know, just like a regular religious community. Um, so okay. Satanists playing D and D. You'd never guess. So so were they right? <laughs> Is it <laughs> really the tool of the devil? <laughs> Absolutely, that's what led me here. <laughs> oh. No, no, your path was drugs. One of the other tools of the well, devil. But D and D came first. Oh, that's where it all. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> D, D and then Polly and then drugs. Is there is there any rock music in there? <laughs> Just industrial, sorry. Oh, okay. Oh, nice. <laughs> That's what. So, we're we talking like some uh, Lords of Acid or what? I like, yeah, I like EBM. I like Lords of Acid. Um, I like Covenant. I like BNB Nation. Yeah, I like Rammstein. I like um, Project Pitchfork. Okay. Yeah, you know, Covenant. really obscure things that most people don't know, but hey. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so this social aspect has been really amazing, um, and I really encourage that. I mean, I don't want it to be like a cult where, oh, we're the family, and if you leave, I don't know, you know, bad cult things happen to you. Um, you know, anybody can leave at any time. Um, but it really is starting to feel like a family. You know, these, these people have never never really had anybody understand Satanism or even a lot of cases, atheism mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, gender nonconformity, you know, things that they've really been demonized for or just questioning, you know, the religious status quo. 
um, they've had to fight that all their life and fight the rejection. And now all of a sudden they're finding acceptance. And, you know, there's a lot of really brilliant conversations that are going on. Um, and I just love to see it all. So. Yeah, no, my experience when I lived in the, the Seattle area was there's, you'll find every type of person there. Just nobody advertises it. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, basically yeah. it, right? You keep to yourself, you find a few friends, and then you live your life. Yeah, yeah, you're little. It's a pretty tight knit community. I mean, the only thing that most people have in common around here is a love for coffee and beer <laughs> mm -hmm. and tech. Don't forget, we're all steeped in oh, tech. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's ours is an incredibly diverse group, um, and I really love uh, to see the people uh, like yourself. Um, Wesley, who who come from the atheist and the humanist communities and, you know, come to us because they want to actually see some action taken. And, um, you know, a lot of people say, well, we're the TST is like atheism with teeth, you know, because we have a religion, mm -hmm. because we mirror the, you know, the Christian right in every way in terms of their religious, you know, privileges, we're a very sharp tool that can be wielded by a lot of people. Um, and so we have, you know, the core group of Satanists, but we also have a lot of allies in the surrounding communities, like the atheist and the humanist communities. Um, well, when I was first, when I was first getting interested in, in the TST or in TST, I, you know, read the tenants like everybody else does. And I thought, you know what, that, that really conforms to my beliefs and how I feel about the world. So yeah, right. I mean, it was, it's kind of a no brainer exactly and we get that from pretty much anybody who reads the tenets like oh yeah i agree with all i agree with all these they're very basic common sense um when we pass out literature we have a flyer that um the front is just just the tenets like without any satanic imagery and on the back is our big satanic you know pentagram logo <laughs> so we hand them the tenets first um, and they read them and they're like, oh, yeah, I agree with that. You know, and then they turn it over and it's got this pentagram on the back. <laughs> like, oh, very nice. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> so we cause people to think, you know, we we create a little bit of dissonance there, especially because, <laughs> you know, the cultural expectations of Satanists is like, you know, baby murdering cultists, you know, mm -hmm. sacrificing things to Lord Satan and and then here we are, you know, with very reasonable tenets, um, trying to do something that a lot of people in America support, which is unseat that theocracy. Um, yeah. So it's kind of neat to see those alliances forming. And it makes me proud to be a Satanist now uh, because I feel like that's more what we're known for now instead of just being selfish, like the Levain type. Mm -hmm. We're known for standing up for people's individual rights against, you know, the terror that is the theocracy up there. Yeah. yeah. And that also is nice to see that there is a, a follow-up to Levain Satanism. Yeah, it definitely was lacking something. And it's certainly, I experienced a lot of misogyny, um, you know, in those communities online. There was, there was elements of racism. Uh, you know, the whole first part of the Satanic Bible is based on a, a tract called Might is Right. Uh, which pretty much sums up mm -hmm. this Darwinism beliefs in there. And so it certainly wasn't ideal, um, but it was enough to shake me out of the, you know, I, I need something outside myself to get things done. Um, so it had that effect, but I, I'm really glad that it's evolved into TSD. I, yeah. I think it's definitely where it should be. And, and it, I'm really happy that it evolved that way because I feel that it fits me way more than the Levan. And our culture needs it. Oh, yeah, so much. And it's kind of hot right now. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Having a group of effectively hedonists and nihilists who dress up and, and play Satanists, that, we, we don't really need that. It's, it's yeah. cool, it's edgy, but we don't need that. Well, that's yeah. called LARPing. Right? <laughs> you do that when you're 13 and you want to piss your parents off. Yeah, but a group of people much. who come out and say, hey, if you have God here, we'll bring Satan. We need that. <laughs> Well, I'm glad we're performing a needed role. I, I definitely feel like that. And it's the first time I've ever felt that society needs Satanists, like that's a part that it needs. Mm -hmm. Usually we're the rejected ones and, and then we reject society and we just, you know, I've, I don't think I would have ever thought I'd see the day that we're actually super productive in society. Yeah. 
and, yeah, and you, totally. it, gives, it gives us a certain immunity being Satanists. I mean, you know, what is the religious right going to call us? Satanists? <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, whereas if you're, you know, atheists, a lot of times there's a concern that, oh, well, you know, we don't want to be called Satan worshipers. Or, you know, we want to be mm-hmm. more mainstream. But Satanism is not about being mainstream. You know, we're just like, yeah, we're Satanists. We're the pariah. So what? <laughs> yeah, I've got a, a fun story from about five years ago. This is uh, before I met my wife. Um, I was uh, had a, a coworker who at one point was talking about heaven and asked me if I wanted to be there. And I said, no. She was like, she just looked at me with a shocked look. Why? It's like, it sounds really boring. And it shut her up. Then <laughs> about a month later, she's like, Dustin, why do you worship Satan? Uh, I said, I seriously don't. I'm an atheist. I don't even believe in Satan. And then about a month after that, she tried to set me up with her sister. Wow. That's bizarre. (laughs) Like, that's a pretty strange progression. Well, I could kind of see the first two, but the third one didn't see that. Well, the the second, at the end of the second one, the, the look she had on her face when I said, can't believe in satan if i don't believe in a god and she just had this dumbfounded look like how is that possible (laughs) and i I, when she was trying to set me up with her sister i was quizzing her a bit about her sister and yeah i was like i i I wouldn't want to date someone who thinks i'm going to hell and she said no you don't have to worry about that with my sister so i have a feeling her sister was at least hinting to being an atheist and uh, she funny. was using me as the uh, the way to try to find out more about that. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, she and her sister was probably the black sheep too. Oh yeah, probably the uh, the college grad from a uh, a uh, immigrant family from Mexico. Oh yeah, who immigrated while the these now adults were children. Oh yeah, uh-huh. yeah. The culture would be very different then between her and yeah, her. yeah. and also living in a yeah. basically Mexican ghetto. Uh, which for, for uh, Boise is a, a city of 35,000 people. Holy shit. Wow. Yeah. Caldwell. It's, it's mostly Mexican at this point. Uh, oh, just like a burb. It's, it's a very old city as far as Idaho goes. Um, my, uh, great grandparents moved there in like 1905. Uh, it had been founded like 1880 or so. And uh, it was just a farming town. And so migrant farm workers came into the area. And as the population in Boise grew and it became pretty much solid city from Boise out to the edge of Caldwell, well, Caldwell was also growing, but a lot of that was with these migrant farm workers with that as their home base. It's further out of downtown and it's in a very heavily agricultural part of the valley. So it's the perfect place for farm labor. Huh. All right, and people have a tendency to want to live near people like themselves fair enough that's why i live in seattle <laughs> i mean these people aren't like me but i feel comfortable here mm-hmm. you know, everybody's quirky enough that you know it doesn't matter yeah I, I live in the neighborhood in boise where well large neighborhood in boise it's a, a the, the bench um is uh I'm in a, a sub neighborhood within that, but it's it's where pretty much all of the uh, Somali and other African refugees in Boise all live. So we have a very substantial Muslim population in my neighborhood. Wow! And it's virtually for this neighborhood the only ethnic diversity. Interesting in Boise, huh? Yeah, yeah. It's a uh, refugee city. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, anyway, let's go ahead and take our last break. If you like this show, consider giving us some financial support. We make it really easy with one-time donations or to support us on a per episode, monthly, or even annual basis using PayPal or Patreon. Find out more at atheistnomads.com. Use the links on the right side of the page. One dollar an episode is all we ask. Please think of the kittens. All right, Lilith, you talked about 
uh, earlier about how you have physical disabilities as well as depression and how you have a hard time getting out of the house. And then you go and you start a social organization that requires meeting with people face to face. No, yeah. don't take this the wrong way, but are you crazy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I actually am. <laughs> Count depression. Um, yeah, you know what? I ask myself that every day. Um, I have tremendous physical challenges. Um, I'm basically waiting uh, on a disability case. I have a disability appeal um, for two conditions, for depression um, and chronic pain. And both of those I have to struggle with every day. Um, so the chronic pain I have is from arthritis. Um, it's in my spine. I have a couple mm. you know, narrow discs um, and then both knees. And it's constant and it's really oh, wow. bad. Um, to sit and run a meeting for an hour and a half just totally kills me. Um, it's really hard for me to sit. So uh, I'd imagine walking and standing would also be hard. Walking is not too bad for a while. Like I walk a lot. I walk about half hour, 40 minutes, at least every day, I'm just around and around the same, like six blocks uh, right around here. Um, and it's kind of the only thing that, that helps with the back. Um, the, the other issue is until my disability comes through, I still have to work. And um, um, I have a writing degree from Harvard and a master's from Stanford. And I used to be a writer, um, but I destroyed all that with the drugs. And so now I'm left doing massage work which is just really terrible on my back. Mm. Um, and it's so hard, you know, to make myself even work because I know I'll, I'll be in like, you know, unbearable pain afterwards, but I have to do it. You know, there's, there's no other option. Uh, you know, you got to pay the rent in Seattle. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I have that challenge. And then to run the meetings and to do all the other stuff that leadership entails is a whole lot more. Um, and so I kind of am in a constant, uh, you know, exhausted state, but, you know, I feel like I'm burning my candle at both ends right now, but this seems like a worthy cause. And I can imagine a lot of activists experience the same thing. Like, you know, this is something that is finally giving meaning to my life and bringing me the community that I always really wanted. So, you know, I'm willing to put in the extra, extra hard work to make it happen. Um, and it's, it's worth it for me. I, I do want to make sure it was clear. This is I, I'm I'm like anticipating feedback on me saying uh, say, using the crazy word. Uh, I meant that not as in terms of diagnosable condition or disorder, but with those struggles, then starting a social organization is seems kind of uh, out so, there to do. <laughs> so what happened is at the time I started it, um, my friend was living here with us, and she was she was paying all the rent. Like she gave me almost a year off where she worked and I didn't. Um, and it mm. allowed me to finish my book, um, The Happy Satanist. But so she encouraged me to, you know, apply to do this thing that I really wanted to do. And at the time I thought I'd have the time and the energy. Um, and then let's see, three weeks after our first TST meeting, she moved out like she found oh. a guy she fell in love and she moved out which was fine you know she paid her share of the rent for like good for her months. bad for you yeah yeah so i you know i had no choice but to start working again doing the job that i can't do you know that i'm basically too disabled to do with the pain so mm. i had to make a decision and it was a really hard decision i was like i don't think i can do both these things but I'm not, you know, I can't let go of the work and I'm just not willing to let go of that chance to have a community and a chance to make a difference. So I knew it would be hard and it certainly has been really hard. Um, you know, meetings are hard, going to events, uh, standing up, you know, uh, it's hard, but, you know, at the end of the day, it's worth it for me. I, I feel like I'm making a difference and I just love the people in the community and seeing them blossom is, is very rewarding. But awesome. it, it takes a lot. It's also, you know, I have I have really bad depression as well. Um, and doing this has, it's kind of inspired me to take better care of myself, you know, like tr actually try to do things to, you know, to mitigate it. Um, you know, I can't really let myself fall into it too much um, because then I can't run the chapter. So mm -hmm. I think having something 
to kind of live for or, you know, work towards. I think that helps keep me out of the, some of the depression. Um, with the really bad pain comes really bad depression, like chemical. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, it's all I can do then to just, you know, not think of ways to not be in this life anymore because it's too painful. Mm. Uh, and along with that comes a lot of self-hate. So, you know, for a person who's a leader and, and has achieved a fair amount, I beat myself up a whole lot. Um, and, you know, it's hard when, when you have that chemical depression, you can't shut those voices off. You can't really outthink them. You know, mm-hmm. people have this idea, oh, it's all in your head. Yeah. You know, oh, well, you're drowning. It's all in your lungs. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that on Facebook. Uh, yeah, but the, 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 it's all in your head thing. That's that's just complete bullshit. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. Because um, what does that even mean? It's all in your head. Your head, in your head is a brain, right? which is an insanely compli- complicated biochemical machine. Right. And the slightest mix up in signals coming in or going out or chemicals in there. Yeah. Well, anything I mean, being slightly off. I've always yeah, thought it's all that in that, your head is bad. <laughs> I've always thought that that is kind of technically right, but when well, they I say it's all in your that. head, it's more like, yeah, I got a fucking chemical imbalance. I have issues. Okay. Yes, it is in my head. Just like, oh, it's all in my spleen when my spleen has something wrong. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, it's the same thing. Or um, with your your back issues, saying it's all in your your spine. Yeah. Well, no shit. <laughs> <laughs> Um, something that I have a little bit of, but I notice a lot of people in the community have is really bad social anxiety. Um, and you know, this really makes sense when you consider that all of us were rejected. Um, you know, I was definitely rejected by my peers for being too smart and too weird, you know, like when I was in kindergarten and, you know, most of us have experienced that same rejection when society, you know, tells you you're a demon or, you know, totally rejects you, that tends to give you a little bit of social anxiety. Mm -hmm. Um, So I know for everyone that comes to the meetings, pretty much, that's a big step for them to take. You know, it's a big group of people. And I really appreciate, you know, despite them having that issue, they still come out. Um, So nice. So anyway. No, I, I've I've definitely noticed that as well with the the atheist community in, in Boise is uh-huh. the amount of us with social anxiety is crazy, especially oh, considering yeah. how you get a whole bunch of socially anxious people together in a crowded noisy place to talk, which is right? why there's tons of beer, and then everybody keeps coming back. Yeah, it's 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 nuts. <laughs> I, yeah, exactly. And it works beautifully. It does. It does. And, you know, I, I feel like a big spigot has turned on and all of a sudden we get that social connection that, that we've been missing. You know, and I think all of us are willing to work through our, our many issues to make that happen. And well, so that keeps me coming back. It helps when you're around a bunch of people who get it. <sighs> right? <laughs> Especially when the majority of your life, you know, probably is spent around people who don't get it. Because, you know, most of society doesn't get it. So, yeah, it's, it's refreshing, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I periodically find myself wondering what other atheists do who don't find community. And then it's like, oh, yeah, they're normal people who have normal friends and they just hang out with their normal friends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Uh, you know, to, to oh, to be a post atheist and just like, yeah, fuck it, world's good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I think us, us people here, we actually see that there is problems in the world, and sometimes we don't know how to solve them. But you know, it's nice being d- around people that at least acknowledge those issues too. Mm-hmm. Right? They don't just bury their head in the sand or say, "Oh well, God will take care of everything." Oof. Yeah. Besides, it's just awesome when the conversation, where the conversation goes after, you know, five, six drinks and nobody's afraid of being judged by anybody else. Yeah. And then you find out where people actually do start judging. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, there is a point, I'm sure. (laughs) (laughs) 
Um, so I yeah. don't think I can sit down for too much longer. Oh, um, okay. So um, guys, yeah. yeah. What do you have to plug? Uh, unless you have uh, any questions, Wesley. <laughs> uh, well, I was kind. Of, I was. I was kind of curious if you don't mind. Are you on any uh any medications for depression or anything? Oh yeah, yeah. I'm on Wellbutrin and Mirtazapine. Um, Does that so, seem to help for you? Yeah, the Wellbutrin helps a whole lot. Definitely. Like I noticed a, a giant difference. Um, I had been on Paxil for eleven years, and okay, uh, my husband and I became homeless like right after we met. Oh my god, what a terrible experience! And I couldn't get my my psych meds, and of course, I went really crazy. Uh, but but it didn't really help me that much throughout my life that I took the Paxil. But uh, mm -hmm. when I got on Wellbutrin, when Obamacare, you know, could finally mm -hmm. pay. For um, I noticed a big difference uh, in the depression. Like I was, I had a lot more energy. Um, <clears throat> it came with some anxiety, but um, I think overall it's been a really a big help of keeping me out of those low lows for sure. So okay. it helped me. Um, also pot, you know, when I'm feeling really bad, a couple plus of pot help. Nice. Yeah. Mm. All right. And what do you have to plug? Um, well, I have to plug my book. Um, I wrote a collection of essays called The Happy Satanist, Finding Self-Empowerment. And you can find The Happy Satanist on Amazon if you search for it. And basically, it's my take on Satanism and a little bit more about my story, you know, of, of how I came to it and how I survived all the homelessness and, and the heroin and everything. So that's that, my plug. That's where, I, and, oh, go ahead. that's where I bought my copy, and I need you to sign it. Okay. I'm down. Mm -hmm. uh, you can also find it on LilithStar.com. That's star with uh, two R's, S-T-A-R-R. -R. All right. I will have links to that website where you can get the book on Amazon. And, uh, of course, the uh, Seattle Satanic Temple website, all in the show notes. Lilith, thank you so much for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you for having me on. Was okay and we'll let you stand up and walk around or whatever else you need to do. <laughs> okay. Thanks so much, you guys. Have a great night. Thanks. Thanks a bunch, Lilith. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to another episode of Atheist Nomads. You can find show notes and contact information at atheistnomads.com. Follow us on Twitter at Atheist Nomads. And like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Atheist Nomads. Please subscribe to the show in iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcatcher of choice. And while you're there, feel free to leave us a review. Theme music is courtesy of Sturdy Fred. Until next time, this has been The Atheist Nomads.